what God has done in our lives through this death, what God has done is what we want to emphasize, right? Because we talk about it all the time. We are a team. This is a team. And when we all play on the same page, we're powerful. When we argue with one another and start pointing fingers or anything, it ain't getting much done, right? So, on that note, yesterday, um, my wife and I, and, and if you saw the picture set up, that's a real, that's a door knob. Um, we, uh, we partnered with Adopt the Block and helped them clean up some of the inner city uh, areas, especially the empty lots. We went down the railroad tracks and picked up trash and so forth. Um, Sherry and Ken Atkins, I'm embarrassed for sure. We both stand up this week. Okay, Sherry. Um, yes, please. She's got like 18 kids. No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, her and her husband actually uh, live on Third Street. And their mission, um, with partnering with, was it the Family Partnering Network? Because it was all strength and strength in that case to get the street. So, so she, she, her family decides to move into a real rough neighborhood. Now you think to yourself, well, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because of her and her husband following the voice of God, they have, they have actually been a light in a dark place. And the Holy Spirit has done the work in that neighborhood. Relationships have been built. Racial barriers a little bit have been broken down. And I'm just watching that and I'm thinking, wow, okay, you're picking up trash. And then a month later you go and you do it again, you're like, geez, same trash, right? You get discouraged. But when you, when you partner with people out in the community and try to get out there, we always end up talking to someone. We always end up, even if it's the people in the group. So I just want to encourage you again, when we're thinking about the missional model, Here's what I want to say. It was my wife and I and my son. We need more people involved. I'm not asking people to burn out. I'm not asking people to be 24 7, but it was two hours on Saturday morning. I understand some people work on Saturdays. I get it. But if you can, it's once a month. Okay? We have the park cleanups. There's plenty of opportunities that we have there. So if you feel that you can only do a little bit once in a while, that's okay. That's all right. You're serving. If you took an hour out of your day to do something like this, you'd be amazed at how God will bless it. Okay? So, um, Mary, am I right? Pretty much out of week in the park. Am I right on that? Okay. So we're going to have what park? The Captain Bucks. Okay. We're going to have the uh, Mary that's up there. The Prime Watch. Is it, is it called the Little Prime Watch now? Okay, so with uh, our new police chief, Jody Farabella, will be there. It's a way for the police to, to partner in the community and people to get to know them. Um, we're going to be there to support her because Mary's a part of our church. We support what she does and we support our community. So, um, what time there? Okay. Did you say it loud enough? There's going to be food. Okay, there's going to be food. Did anybody get that back here? All right. And it's free. There you go. Oh, free. Food. Now it's a new purpose. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, Graham Watch. Right. Okay. Food runs out. Food will be served until we So, noon to three, right? Noon to three. Okay. There's going to be a tenth for me. People can get it. The adults can get information. Kids will have something to do for having a lot of jazz. Awesome. Awesome. We have the sheriff's department. Uh, with the police department, um, there's going to be a few demonstrations, uh, not to mention uh, the health department's going to be there. Okay. Um, so we have the entire city government, right? Yeah, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> uh, there may be a few uh, officials, okay. uh, not just Mayor. Well, besides them, commissioners, uh, commissioners also may be. Okay. So we got the whole enchilada, we got the whole party going. If you guys want to know more details, see Mary after after everything's over. I'm sure she'll give you plenty of the prayer. I've been warned. Don't forget.
Yeah, you're going to be here to pray with people. Yes, I think uh, If you're not from this area, let me encourage you that you can do this in your area. This isn't just, we're just, just we're, our, our main mission is Milton. But for those of you that come from different areas, you can do this in your town. Whatever it may be, partner with people, get to know the police force, the fire department, reach out to, to the community, and try to build relationships. Because right now, more and more cops are being killed. Now there's a flip side to that, because people are getting killed because cops, some of them, are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So now you've got these big disparities, right? So now we're never we need to build bridges, especially in our area, because we have a lot of high crime, trying to work on getting that down. We need to support our police department. So on that note, the last thing I always tell people was get in the game. Invite someone to church, connect with each other. Uh, a lot of times we'll do it all the time. After the service is over, we have some refreshments and things. This is the time. Get to know people. And if you're new here, and some of you that aren't, and you see somebody new, please go over and introduce yourself. I don't want people walking out of here saying, nobody said a word to me. I hear that a lot. I don't want our church to have that reputation. I want people to come in here and say, somebody talk to me. I like that church. Even if they don't make this their, their home, they had a pleasant experience here. And that's what they were doing. And finally, do the cheerful heart. I'm going to tell you, there's some things on the horizon that we prayed about finances. Because there's a lot of things that I believe God's going to have us in that is going to involve not just steer, but pulling people from outside into the business arena of having investors and people to support some of the initiatives that we're going to be involved in. That in order for our church to continue to do what we're doing, we have the lights on that we have. We need to continue to be able to pay the rent and I try to keep cost low as much as it can. So, um, Google phone, by the way, is free. Just say so you know. Church phone number is 856 300 2552. But the bottom line is, I don't have a separate line for that. I got it for free. And it still gets close. So there's things like that that we do here that we keep the cost low so that we can maximize what we're doing. Okay? So on that note, let's pray. I've got to get to you already, Ryan, for the sermon. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. We want to praise you, God, for this day you made. We ask, Lord, that you give me, give me, bless. I pray, Lord, that I just feel it. Something is about to break here, Lord. And I ask, Father God, that you just meet people where they're at. And I ask, Father, that they have an encounter with your Son today. Be the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. We think 
we're less spiritual if we're suddenly in a depressed state. And I'm here to tell you that I did a message in my old church four years ago called the Great Depression. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find notes electronically. I couldn't find any recollection of it. And here I happened to pull out my filing cabinet and I found the original notes I started four years ago. And what I'm going to bring to you today is the newer version of it, but it is going to be a message called the Great Depression. When you see this, this picture right here, this is a very famous picture of what was happening in the 1930s and 40s. The roaring 20s, people were just going nuts with all the prosperity. There were even comments from the president at that time that said, hey, I don't think poverty is even an issue in the next 10 years. Everything's going to happen. The stock market was going through the roof. Everybody was investing. People were dancing it up. Women were cutting their hair, like real short. And their life was just a big party. In 1929, that, and the stock market went, and people lost it all. They lost it all. People were jumping out of windows committing suicide because they had nothing. Everything that they owned was gone. I can't even imagine that. Even with the Great Recession we had in 2008, a lot happened then. Picture that on a larger magnitude where there was no soap and no unemployment insurance. There were no safety nets. They lost it all. And I tied it into the fact that we have moments in our life that we may suffer from depression. And it could be for various reasons. But many people right now are just trying to survive one day at a time, one moment at a time. Because the depression is so heavy. And even amongst believers, even amongst believers, so let me get into it. What is the definition of depression? Well, Webster says, a state of feeling sad. Or it could be a serious medical condition in which a person feels very sad, hopeless, or unimportant, and often is unable to live in the normal way. And it also talks about economic uh, activity that, unfortunately, jobs are not there. So, that word right there, hopeless, our slogan in our church is take the step, hope is here. Because I heard when we first came here, a lot of hopelessness. A lot of hopelessness. There is no hope. There is no hope. There is no hope. And I just wanted to scream at them and say, yes, there is. It's Jesus. In certain aspects, I couldn't because I was in governmental circles and different places where they didn't want to hear about Jesus or I wasn't allowed to see Jesus. But I'm here to tell you that when you, when you come across people, and it could be you right now, feeling hopeless, there is hope. There is hope. There is hope for all of us. You can have a moment of discouragement. The difference between discouragement and depression. Discouragement is a temporary setback that is short lived. You know, you can have something that doesn't go right for you. You go, oh man, that's hard. You know? But eventually you get over it and you move on. It's not a huge thing. Depression is like the atom bomb. You know? And all of a sudden, everything blows up. It's a constant discouragement that leads to a long-term issue, which seems like no end is in sight. Has you guys ever felt like that? I know I have. Where you just feel like the light is not at the end of the tunnel. Matter of fact, there's no light at all. You're in the tunnel, and you're staring in darkness, and you have no idea how you're getting out of it. And day by day, hour by hour, it just continues to go on. So, what are some causes for depression? Now, I want you to remember something. We have a mind, a body, and a spirit. We are made in the likeness of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, made in one. The Father represents the mind. Jesus represents the body, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit. And so, if one thing is off on that, it throws the whole thing off. And I'll tell you why. Your mind. Psychological factors such as trauma or an event in your life that has altered your way of living. That trauma could look like a divorce, a death in the family, 
a loss of job, believe it or not, to say the least, you could have witnessed the murder. My mother-in-law witnessed the murder when she was a kid. Messed her up for a long time. Trauma can happen in all kinds of ways. And the minute that the minute that trauma happens, we may think that we're dealing with it or we're okay, but the mind is very powerful. And I'm talking first-hand experience because some of the things in my mind is telling my body this week, he was making my heart look like this for no reason. And I'm like, really? I have nothing to be fearful about. All of a sudden I feel like it's going like this. The mind can play tricks on it. But the minute we have something happen in our lives that throws us off, or it's devastating. I mean, I've talked to people who had a death in the family, a spouse, they never got past it. A child, they weren't supposed to bear it. And all of a sudden, it just sends them off in a different direction for the rest of their life. Because they can't cope with it. And so that happens. Depression, all these different things can sprout out of it. Believe it or not, this is one that I really didn't even realize until back in 2011. When I did this. Five, nutrient deficiency. Or excess drugs like prescription or illicit caffeine will actually excite an anxiety attack. My wife gave me a little bit of dark chocolate years ago. And she said, here, honey, let's watch a movie. And I was already shaking like this. And I'm like, yeah, okay. She gave me that chocolate. I went outside. I was shooting free throws in the rain. I just, that's all I kept doing was popping off. I couldn't sit still. It's a feeling like you're feeling like you're going to die. And some of you know what I'm talking about. It's heavy. Hormonal imbalances. I'll just leave it be at that. Alright? Especially the ladies. Right. Natural light uh, deprivation. Um, that, what's it called? Sundown or something? You know, if, if I'm in a dark room, I can feel myself changing. And if I feel like I'm locked into something and I can't get out, or I can't see sunlight, I get a little nuts. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or I'm only crazy when I'm here, right? I, 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 I do. It, it, it has an effect on me. If it's a long time of rain, I've never lived in Washington State. So all they get is rain. I, I'd be like, like this, you know? Because I, I like the sun. I like to see the sun. Even if it's cold outside, at least if I see the sun. But if it's snowing out constantly, I love snow, but when it's constant day after day, I start getting like this. I gotta see, I gotta see sun. I gotta think of Disney World, because that's in Florida. You know, I gotta like, look at an orange and go, oh yeah, you know? Like those commercials where they put the straw in there. Like, so, um, low serotonin levels. A chemical that re it, it regulates appetite, sleep, and moods. If you don't get enough sleep, that messed you up. And at that time, back in 2011, or actually going back to 20 or whatever, 2008, I had, I found out that I had serious sleep back. And I wasn't sleeping. Right. I wasn't getting the air back. So it was messing me up really bad. And it was playing with my mind. So, spirit, you can't see God. You can't see anything but yourself. You feel like he's gone, or maybe you don't even know who he is. So it's, it's almost like, okay, the God thing's over with. He disappeared. You're on your own. You ever feel like that? Like you're going through something, and all of a sudden it's like God just kind of went, okay, I'll see you later. Hi, Steve. Are you dancing? I'll be out He leaves, right? It, it, it. But we feel disconnected from him because we feel like a cloud is over us. Right? So... Look at these two comparisons. The outlook of an unsaved person and a saved person. What I mean by that is someone who doesn't know Jesus and someone who does. When I ask what brings you pleasure in life, for an unsaved person, most most are depressed to say things like nothing. Or they'll say, well, you know, drugs, or drink, or whatever else they're into. But a saved person will say something because Safe person is more guarded because they fear if they admit the nothing answer, they will be full out unspiritual. So they say something like, 
well, you know, being saved or knowing Jesus, they give the right answers, right? The saved, depressed person generally knows about their eternal and heavenly blessings for which they are thankful, but they feel trapped now because they inexplicable emotional tones and moods. Don't be a super Christian. What do I mean by this? Again, let's just put this play, play it out. You're a person that's sitting here that knows Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've surrendered your life and repented of your sins. And now His Spirit lives inside you. And you're depressed. What do we do as super Christians? Well, we do things like this. I know I'm blessed by the best. No weapon formed against me. That's great. That's scripture. That's good. But here's the thing. When we do that, but we're really battling something, we're not letting other people see us be real. Did you guys catch that? We're not letting people see the real deal. See, there's enough phony Christians out in the world, isn't there? There's enough of the, you know, you, you talk to somebody and you're like, you know, how you doing? They're like, oh, eternally blessed. I'm going to be in the kingdom. I represent this and that. That's great. Wonderful. Okay? But in the meantime, if you really peel back the mirror, their marriage is a mess. But they're not going to tell you that because they're blessed by the best. Because, you know, if you got Jesus, there ain't a problem in the world. Game over, right? Okay, I can't use this word in church, but it's a bunch of crap. I'm just calling it the way it is. It's a bunch of garbage. Because there were people in the Bible that didn't say that. I don't know where we get this Christianity from, that we just make up this stuff, that everything is pie in the sky. If you look at, as we did a few weeks back, all but one disciple were killed for their faith. I didn't see any prosperity out of that, did you? Being sawed in half, crucified upside down, stabbed to death, thrown off in and, 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 you know, a high building. I'm sure their answer was blessed by the best. Now in scripture, they talked about the honor of dying for him because they know where they're going. It's different. But I'm here to tell you that this facade that we put on as Christians is, I just want to scream sometimes. I'm like, you're, you're, you're telling me that you're okay, but you're not. And the tragedy is we walk into church and we do the same thing, don't we? We can't let anybody see we got problems. You come in, it's like, hey, brother, such and such, you know, hey, how's it going? Yo, you know? And it's great because this is the place that we need to do that, right? But in the meantime, you're getting torn apart inside, and you feel like you can't say anything because you're going to be judged. <clears throat> so what do we do? Da -da -da! I am super Christian, and we, you know, we put the Bible in our hand, and you know, we're like this, you know, and and everything looks great, doesn't it? Everything looks fine. I'm good. In the meantime, your life is falling apart by the moment. It's crumbling like a big building. Right? No. No. We can't do this. Do you know there are biblical characters that were, that were depressed in the Bible? You guys aware of that? And if they wrote that way and wrote flowery things, there really would be no need to read the Bible. Because they'd be like, you don't know what I'm going through. That was over 2,000 years ago. You guys had it great. You don't know the hell I'm going through right now. But see, they did. Because David, who the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart, he messed up too. But there was a moment for 10 years that he was on the run from King Saul who was trying to kill him for no other reason than jealousy. And when he wrote Psalms, or some of the Psalms, some of these poetic, they almost like songs, some of these songs weren't too happy. Some of them were like, oh, you know, you'll see them on like a calendar, and, you know, and you'll see a picture of the sun, and they're like, you know, bless me the Lord, you know, and, and 
I will fly away and be with him forever, and it's great. That was when he had an update, when the Xanax was good, you know? And then when he hit the low point, he would say things like this. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remember you, God, and I groaned and I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. Wow, I don't see a bumper sticker with that one. I don't see a shirt that has that printed on. Do you? He was overwhelmed with grief and sadness. And he knew who was there for him. But his feelings were different. And your feelings aren't saved, are they? You can feel a certain way. Faith isn't based on feeling. Elijah. Huge. One of the biggest and greatest prophets in the Bible. When Elijah was on the run from Jezebel, one that killed him. He says this. He says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his, for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while he himself went on a day's journey to the wilderness, he came to a tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Another bumper sticker you won't see. Imagine if we put that on the outside of the building. No. Job. He was tested by God. Now here's a man, in case you're not familiar with Job. Here's a man who did all the things to honor God. And yet within a day and a half, he lost it all. Because he didn't know what was going on in the heavenly realm. The Satan was saying, look, God, if you let me out, I'll deny you. And God allowed him to go through the test. I'm going to walk you through some of the scripture because my middle name could have been that. As a matter of fact, my first name could have been that. This week says here, Job 3.25, When I fear, what I fear has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. I can relate to that scripture. I don't know about you guys. You can put the, the mask on, that's cool. I pass I'm good. I'm the only crazy one, I'm going to tell you, I know what that's like. I know what that's like. Your worst nightmare is what it's saying. Your worst nightmare has finally come true. It's manifested itself. It's there now. And in the meantime, you've been worshiping God. You have been, you have been before Him. And all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be the way the game of faith is supposed to be played. I worship God, I obey Him, then good things happen, right? Ah, then all of a sudden, you go into the wilderness. Or there are no rules. God says, you trust me now. You trust me when all hell's breaking loose in your life. Now what? I've taken your money away. I've taken your family away. I've taken everything that you thought was your support mechanism. What you going to do now? Right? Think about that. Because if all that goes away... Do we still worship Him? Do we still love Him? Yes. Is He our everything? Yes. Where well, everything is gone. Yes. Let me take you on a personal journey in my life. This picture actually was the one I wanted to put up, but I'll tell you about the meaning of this in a minute. Back in 2004, it was when Marie and I had an encounter with Jesus. Back in Gloucester County Community Church, we lived in Nation. Realized my calling in 2005 was to start a church back in my hometown of Milton. That long ago. Ta da! Here today. Okay? Joined Gloucester County Community Church's intern program in 2006. I worked full time, raised a family, and continued the intern. They were not so easy years to tell you. Thanks to Greg. Anyway, the Great Recession started to happen around the end of 2007 and 2008. In 2008, my wife came home and told me that her position was eliminated and that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I was already shaking in my boots with that one, but I knew that we needed to do something. So that was the leap of faith. Then, 2008, I was working of all places. I was working here at Kirchheimer, which is the old baby class. 
And there were two people that were on the turn. You know, like, people got to stop getting pregnant, okay? Just saying, all right? Because they put me in and say, oh, yeah, do that job and yours. I was exhausted by the time we ended that year. So what we did was instead of buying our kids gifts, we would go on a trip to Disney every year. That's what we would do. Money. I was so tired. Remember, sleep at me. I didn't know I had it. I was falling. I was doing like cups of coffee at the desk, like nothing. I mean, I would just sit there like, you know, and it's like way the saliva off and, you know, and roll yeah. over again, you know. So by mid-January, ran the trip. By mid-January 2009, I was told Gershon are no longer needing my services. I got the pink slip. I didn't think I could call down the office. I've worked since I was 13. I was laid off from one job to one week. I worked all those years in various positions. I didn't know what it was like to sit on the bench. Okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's a reason why I told you that. Just come back to that. So here I come. Back home, with a little box of stuff, and I remember I had children. I packed my lunch. They basically said, okay, we're going to escort you out to the door. Here's your car, here's your key. Goodbye. That was the thanks you got. I drove home, I didn't listen to one stitch of music. I was numb. And I remember when I got to the front door, I didn't tell my wife that she was out doing something. And I remember God saying to me, spend some time with me. Like plain as day, just, just like that. Just like go off for a walk. Just know. It's like, what do I do now? You know, here I'm raised out, and now I'm on this. And overnight, we were upper middle class to below poverty level. Like that. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. But wait, I'm supposed to be a pastor. This isn't supposed to happen. Everything is going to go to me. I'm going to, we're going to find a house down here. We're going to, you know, we're going to move into Millville when the time comes. Everything will go as planned. Right, Linda? Everything will go as planned. No problem. The church will open up. We'll just have all the people just sitting here. I'll preach. Life is good. Vision taken. Good. Now, when, when Job, three days later, after I got laid off, some of you know that. He called me from the road on Route 55. The lady was killed. And he said, a happier than he ever read. He was going through a divorce. I don't even know the personal stuff, but he was an intern. And he called me that night. I, I, I didn't answer the phone at first. It's like, it's a call, you know, I don't want to talk to I'm watching, you know, 40 years of new or whatever. You know, it's snowing out. I'm like, just leave me alone. I'm going to get fat and die in my chair, you know? <laughs> so we're all sitting there watching it and everything. I'm like, oh, okay. And then he's told me, called again. I'm like, I better answer this. And he's like, you know, this is Steve. Tell your family to well. I said, like, dude, I do that all the time. He's like, no, no, no. I really want you to tell them. And you love them. Okay, well, yeah, I don't got it. And that was it. Got a message the following morning that his truck had been hit right around, I think, the garden, the garden road exit, uh, uh, exit 35 and 55. And it was, it, it flipped. He was killed instantly. His daughter's amazingly lived. The car went to the other side of 55 where it was hit by oncoming traffic. Tools everywhere, things totaled. When I saw him in that coffin, I didn't recognize him. There were actually two viewings here, one here in Byland, and another one up in the Durham Church. I couldn't believe it. We were about the same age at the time. He was like 40, 41, somewhere like that. And here he is, he's gone. I lose my job. My wife is now unemployed. Here goes a good friend. What the heck is happening? You ever, you ever said that to yourself? When you start thinking, like, am I losing my sanity? Like, what else could happen in my life, right? What else could go wrong, as the famous one says? In my life, this is the start of what I call the Great Depression. And I started to slide. And every day just started to kind of run together. And if the trash didn't go out this day, you go out the next day. 
can you make the bed that bed? Yeah, you just do it. Okay. And just things just started to slide. And I started to go off a spiritual course. I started looking at other things other than the Bible. I started saying, you know what? I thought that Bible was really real. I started looking at things like, hey, wouldn't it be great to do something called Jingle Mail? Which at the time, Jingle Mail was, you tell the bank, I'm leaving my, the keys to the house in the mailbox. You take it. That's what they called it, Jingle Mail. So I was like, ooh, Jingle Mail. <laughs> like it. Right? I was ready to hit Montana. I was like, we ain't going nowhere. You know where we're going. And you know what the deal is. I'm like, no, and I fall like a little kid. I fall like I'm not going to Millville. I'm not doing that. This is over. We drank the Jesus juice. Let's face it. It's a facade. That's where I was at. Because I was like, how can this be? I don't know what in the world's going to happen to us. You ever felt like that? Now all of a sudden, we're, we're scared picking all the retirement money that we, we had is gone. We spent it just to survive. That's what I'm going for a year and a half. That's unheard of. And yet, when it finally came down to it, we put the house up for sale. When we put the house up for sale, there were a lot of people that walked in with no tapers. Because our value of our home went upside down. We had a home that was 10 years away from being paid off. Suddenly, we were in the negative. Like that. So now, what do we do? I remember going to a friend's house and she said, you can stay with us. They're walking through it going, is this good? This is what it's coming down to. And I remember one day my grandfather found out about it and said, listen, I'm living with this. I'm living with it. This, my step-grandmother had passed. He was 86 years old. And the house we're living in today, that's where we had built. And let me tell you something, guys. For all the men out there, when all of a sudden you were, you know, you were taking your castle and everything has been taken away, job, respect, you feel like you're worth nothing because now all of a sudden you can't provide for your family. And then let alone you have a grandfather to answer to because now you're in his house. There was something I read in the devotional one day that spoke to me and said, unless you're willing to take orders, I'll never get them. I had to learn how to take orders before I could be in this position. I had to learn to put my stinking ego aside and get humble. My wife was hoping she's going, oh yeah. Because every time you know, she hears me going, oh, I'm going to be humble. And she's like, yes, prayer works. You know? and I just see a look on her face. She's got that, like, you know, clean her eyes. She's like, yeah. Uh, I'll get you home. Die. Do a miracle on Steve. Whammo. Here we go. You know? So, and when he wants to do that, believe it or not, it's a great thing. But when you're going through it, it's hard. Oh, God, does it hurt? Lord, does it hurt? This is how I felt. If you think the Bible isn't living and breathing, I don't know what to tell you. Look, at first my thoughts were like, I'm naked, I come from my, my mother's womb, and naked out of the park. The Lord gave, the Lord saved away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Cool. On to something new, right? Sounds great, doesn't it? That's a good super Christian in me. Yeah, I took it away. But we're going to move to something greater, right? And then, you know, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? You know, it sounds great. Okay, we'll get through this. A little disappointment. A little setback. Then, it starts turning into this. May the, death, may the day of my birth perish every night instead of the reason to see. And as days and months pass, I start to see things that self did. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant what I hope for. That God would be willing to crush me and let loose his hand and cut my leg. Sleeplessness. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on and I toss and turn until dawn. 
You know how many insomniacs are in this room? You guys better be working in the graveyard shift for Coke Blow, it's all I'm saying. So, but you know, until you, until you have, until you have a bit of of sleep where it becomes a war because you don't know when the next anxiety attack is going to happen, it's hell. It's hell. And if it wasn't for my wife, and she still does it to this day, I kind of put my head in her lap and she just rubs me and starts praying over me. I'm telling you, I'm like, I'm like a scared little child. Something that you would take for granted, oh, I'm tired, I'm just going to sleep. Now I'm here all jacked up. Then you get sorrow. If only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God, God's rod from me. So his terror would break me no more. Because you feel like he's put his thumb on you so hard and so heavy that you just can't breathe. Oh, I'm telling you. Then it went to anger. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out of the bitterness of my soul. I'm a preacher. Don't you preach to me when I'm going through something. Yes. <laughs> my wife starts doing that, man, we get into a war. I'm like, don't you preach to me. And the word says that you should, no, I don't want to hear it, you know? Because I'm going through it. Let me feel it. Let me let me take it in. Then I'll get there. But in the meantime, I don't want to hear nothing from nobody. And whenever I had good godly men in my life that were, were saying to me in a restaurant, I'm showing cheese fries in my face. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 and they're like, are you sure you heard from God about this whole thing? And I wanted to pick up the fork and just. And I, and I was like, I don't know now. How's that sound to you? Well, you know, God says it. I don't care what God says. Take his hand off of me. That's where I was at. Because it hurts. It hurts to be humble. Guys, loneliness is a real thing. People in the Bible, Jesus experienced loneliness. He cried and was seeking out God and saying, there, there's another way past this cup. That's the Son of God saying this. Are you with me? Yes. You guys are with me, right? Jesus is saying this. If He says it, you think we can? I say to God, do not declare me guilty. But tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me? To spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Because I saw people around me that were believers. They were, they were flourishing. Oh, they were having a blast. Relatives? Oh, yeah, I've got this car now. I'll take a look at this thing. In the meantime, we're losing everything. Oh, yeah, we got that. And we did this. And the neighbor says, look, look. I got here. And I'm looking at like, yeah, great. Wonderful. Peachy. And, and, and I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. I served you. I served you with all my heart. I tried to do the best I could to serve you. This is the things I get. And you know what that statement is? It's self-righteousness. That's not humility. That's self-righteousness. Because the question is, will we serve him when all hell breaks loose? Will we still hang in there when the bank account is laughing at you saying, what do you think about <laughs> that card and that machine? Because there ain't nothing there. You can't get a blood from a stone. Don't even think about it. You want to you try to put gas in the car? You start acting like Fred Flintstone. Get the feet moving because you ain't getting it. Okay? Listen to this. Panic attacks. Did you know that the word panic actually derives from the Greek language pertaining to the shepherd god Pan? I actually saw this place in Israel. I'll tell you about that in a second. Pan took amusement from frightening herds of goats and sheep in a sudden burst of uncontrollable fear. There is a place in Israel that I saw where they believed it was the gate of hell. And this is where the god of Pan hid out. Okay, I kept a good healthy distance from that joint because it was like this big cave, almost like a back cave. 
but there wasn't no Batman coming out. And I'm waiting for some hooded thing out of the Chronicles of Narnia to come out and play a fool, you know, and go, ah, you know. And, and I'm, I'm, they're like, oh, yeah, it's right in there. And they believe that people can walk it further, you know, it's, it's the answer way to hell. And I'm like, congratulations, I'll be over here. Come on, you know. And they talked about this. People actually, they, they panic because they fear that this thing, this God that they, they, that they came up with, is going to do this. Well, guess what? It's lower G, isn't it? Satan the one to God. That's what happens. He doesn't want us to have peace. God wants peace. But he will allow things to happen in our lives sometimes. It's not a one-size-fits-all rule about depression. Some of it could be ourselves doing things. Ourselves shooting ourselves in the foot. There's also spiritual warfare out there. And if you're in a different state of mind, how can you fulfill what God wants you to do? But He's in control. You guys can hear me. He's in control. I want you to notice that everything you're going to hear and have heard, God is the final authority of everything. I don't sit there and spend a lot of time talking to the devil. He, we know each other very well. He knows what I think about Him, and He knows, you know, vice versa. I spend my time in adversity with my Father. Because he's the one that puts the crush on him. He's the one that can, do, that can take care of the situation. I can't go ahead and with him. I have the authority in me to. But I choose to, to, to have that conversation with God to say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me out of this? Heal me, Lord. Show me the way out of this. But what are you trying to affect me? And it's rough because my wife, her infinite wisdom, will tell me, honey, she did to me recently in the last couple weeks when I went to the hospital. She said, you are being humble because you are about to get into something way greater and your blood better be humble and you are to handle it. Which tells me that we're about to enter stage two. And if, if I'm not in that humble mind and I get higher and mighty and I get into that, it's going to be worse than you can ever imagine. Church said, Amen. Amen. Panic attacks happen as well. Jordan? Panic attacks can happen as well. I can be, it could be from driving, sitting in a room. It could be in the middle of the night, being in a church service. The church I came from, it fit a thousand people in its sanctuary. And I remember going up into the balcony and feeling like I was going to fall off. I remember one time Pastor Bruce was showing me how to do a wedding. And he asked a few of us to hang out at a, at a wedding rehearsal. And I remember all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I felt my heart just beating heavy and sweat just pouring me out of me. I had to run out of it. An Easter play that we, that we had eight shows with a thousand people in the play. We had free, free thing. These are, these are producers to list. And I remember when they were talking about the exit signs, heart started beating, sweat started pouring. I had to run the heck out of it. It is an awful feeling. I'm going to tell you guys, by the grace of God, He brings us to us. I, I, I can't explain it. And I'm not saying that there's a one size fits all to this, but when you stay before God and be through it, look at what you're going through. You made it. But I look a lot like that guy at times. And my wife knows when someone's going down with me because that's the best of hit my heart. And I gotta literally calm down. I mean one night. Donna Miles who comes here, she lives around the corner, her mom's a retired nurse, Donna's a nurse. I had both of them over working me with both arms. Pulse, oxidation level, the whole deal. Because I was breathing, I was just playing drums. I hyperventilated. It's actually a figure that talk to you. See, that's what it is, Jason. <laughs> um, and I, I put down the phone and I couldn't breathe. I literally couldn't breathe, I thought I was dying. To teach me how to breathe, but people that. 
I'm like, really? I've seen these in movies. I've seen these on airplanes. I gotta breathe through it. I didn't care. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get my breath. And they had to talk me off a cliff by squeezing my, my wrists and having me squeeze hers and saying to me, think of something that you enjoy. Think of something you like. Think of something that brings you joy. Close my eyes and start to visualize. And as I'm doing it, she's reading my blood pressure. It's coming down. It's coming down. It's coming down. But my mind, flight or flight, is wide awake. It's going, it's cruising, it's happening. So your body is saying this, and your mind is in, in, in your mind, but you, you, your heart, your soul is saying something different. It, it's, it's not good. But this is the byproduct of what happened between 2008 and 2012. We lost our home, our credit, the goal we had, our kids were in a private school the church had. Our dignity, our jobs, and at points in time, our money. Because my wife was the only one that was trying to keep it together, and I was falling off the cliff. The sun brought her down, so we would sit at the table, and I would just push the food back and just cry at the table. For no reason. I didn't want to eat. I, I, I desperately didn't want to go to sleep. The first, thing, the first two times I had an anxiety attack, one was in Israel on a plane. The second one, actually the second one was in the Wailing Wall on the Red Tunnel. And the third one was when I drove across the Golden Bridge. To this day, I don't drive across the bridge. I haven't got that point yet. I've done it since. But the last time I went to Delaware a few weeks back, I had my daughter there. It had an impact on me so bad. When you're on top of a bridge and all of a sudden you feel like you're dying, it is not a good feeling. And I went to the Phillies game. So if you're sitting up on the second level, I could look down the game. So I thought the whole thing was spinning on. I feel like vertigo. That's a real pleasant feeling. And on the way back, when we started to drive over, I said, you know, guys, you really need to start praying now. So I'm having another one. And they were yelling, Jesus in the car is so loud and looking funny. We were having church, and I'm going over this bridge, and I'm going, God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Then I'm done then. And by the time I got home, I couldn't sleep. The next day was Mother's Day. I got behind the wheel to start the car. I freaked out, went inside, hit the ground, prayed, cried like I've never had before, and said, why are you doing this to me, God? I couldn't drive around the corner to go to Wawa. That's how debilitating it gets. And see, people think they're nuts because they can't do this stuff. I know people that won't sit in this service because they have that problem. It's real. But there's great news at the end of this message of how we can do it. But you never know what it may come. By the way, with this whole thing with my grandfather, Years while he was alive in the state. Twitching, not sleeping right, trying to drive down 55 to go to Washington Township every day. One day I was sitting in a recliner and I remember listening to a song called The Man from, from Nazareth. And it was, it was a Christian rock band. And all of a sudden I felt the spirit come over me. And all I kept saying was, it is finished, it is finished, it is finished, it is finished. I couldn't stop it. Anything that I, I, I looked at scripture and I kept saying it more, it is finished, it is finished. A couple days after that, my grandfather fell in the middle of the Maybe about a day later, my parents took him to the hospital and I never saw him again. The next time I saw him, I was going to service. That house was lost. We inherited a home and a car. Pretty good. I don't say that to brag about me. I say that because God is just. At the end of the story of Job, he restored everything and gave him the mission. Because he 
and never gave up on his integrity. I don't care what you've been through and where you're at, what you're suffering from right now. I'm here to tell you guys there is hope. There is a reason for it. I don't know all the reasons, guys. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke at you and tell you it's just one little thing, just do that. You get a little bit more spiritual, then you'll be fine. No, I don't know why God is allowing it. I don't have that answer. But I can tell you that when we come here and we talk about how to deal with things, this is what the Word of God is supposed to do. This is why life experience happens. And as my wife has said to me, it's three times I've given you credit today. I'm getting four, I'm getting better. Thanks, man. There you go. When, when, when we, as a pastor, I'm going to get hit. Because then I'm supposed to tell you that you're not alone. That, that, that the things that you're going through, I said to people, I said, if you slip my wrist right now, it ain't going to bleed and you're going to be calling in yours. If something happened to me when I went to the hospital a couple weeks ago, my heart was racing, guess what? They didn't say, oh, he's a pastor. We're going to put him in a special room. And we're going to give him new fluids that nobody's ever seen these. Oh, man. I'm like, yo, Valium, you know, the little Ativan. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Whatever you can calm my heart down, I'm good. They put the same monitors on me and everything. Blood pressure sky high. And I'm sitting there going, I'm cold. Because I'm no different than you. But God wants us to, to pay attention to His Word and, and let you see that you're not alone. I had people around me, a small group of people around me, that stuck with me through those years. Most didn't. And you know what's great? When you're an intern, you know, they stick you with the crappies and crap jobs, you know, because you get a lot of ability. So, you know, you do all the stuff that whatever the other pastors want to do. <laughs> so, you know, I would be greeting people. Hi, how you doing? You know, how's it going? And, you know, and, and all these kinds of things. <laughs> They're like, how you doing, Steve? I'm like, I'm good. Let, 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 bless, me, bless me the Lord, you know? In the meantime, I'm having a, I'm, I'm having a complete meltdown inside. But i got to tell everybody else, hey, glory be to God. Have a blessed day. But I'm, inside, I'm going, I don't know how I'm going to survive today. And they had three services. I do it on a Saturday night, and I would do it on a Sunday. Well, the pastor, that's OCD. So if he did it wrong, you heard about it. It was like, you know, it was like, I just said, wax off, wax off, you know? But then, you know, you kind of go through that whole thing, right? But, but when you're going through stuff, and you're trying to just do basic things, just basic things that most people take for granted, but it's a struggle for you. The struggle is real, isn't it? So how do we deal with it? Check it out. Your mind. Renew your mind. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I wish I had spent more time in the Bible before that time. I didn't. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to say it. Okay? But good nutrition, diet, exercise, and you lose pizza. Sorry. Um, but seriously, that has nothing to do with it. Avoid alcohol, caffeine, and other stimulants. Possible medication. Now, this is a sticky one. Okay? I ain't mad at anybody, and nor is it my job to judge anyone who takes Xanax or any of the other stuff that doctors prescribe. But all I'm going to say to you is this. Before you go and do this, seek God. To some people, it may be what they need. Some people, it may not be, but they're running to the pill first. Okay? So it's not to judge anyone. It's not to say, because I didn't do the pill. Alright, I went natural. That doesn't make me a hero. And all I'm saying is, is that before you make this step, be in prayer. Okay? In spirit, regular spiritual exercise. Reading, studying, praying, meditating on the Word. There's a video that my wife had, as a matter of fact, completed the healing service here. It goes on for an hour that a man with a piano in the background, with beautiful pictures, is reading every scripture from start to finish in the Bible about healing. 
And as you're listening to it, you're hearing it over and over and over again. Boy, did that put me in my heart to peace. Some things like that. But the most important thing is, know who you are in Christ. Guys, this isn't ideal, but I'm going to read this. There's 90 statements, at least, in the Bible that says who you are in Christ. They say things like, I am blameless and free from accusation. Christ himself is in me. I am firmly rooted in Christ and now being built up in him. I have been made complete in Christ. I have been spiritually circumcised. My old unregenerate nature has been removed. I have been very raised and made alive in Christ. I died with Christ and I have been raised up with him. My life is now hidden with Christ in God. Christ is now in my life. I am an expression of the life of